Hi everybody, my name is Kevin Walker. I'm the Head of Science at the Botanical Society of Britain and Ireland. And over the last 20 years, I've been working very closely with colleagues from the BSBI and also the UK Centre for, for Ecology and Hydrology on the project. And my role today is to just give you a little bit of background about the project, uh, just describe some of the outputs that we're launching and also uh, just present some of the main findings uh, from the project uh, for Britain. So the main aim of Plant Atlas 2020 was very simple, uh, to map the distribution of all flowering plants and ferns found growing in the wild in Britain and Ireland, and that also includes uh, the Channel Islands and the Isle of Man. So over a 20 year period, we had thousands of botanists out scouring the British and Irish countryside, looking for plants such as the species shown on the left here, early marsh orchid, uh, and collecting very precise uh, grid references and locations for all those species they found growing in the wild. And then we took all that information and used it to produce dot distribution maps, like the one shown on the right-hand side of this slide, which is the distribution of the early marsh orchid. Uh, and this is mapped, uh, the distribution is mapped at 10 by 10 kilometer grid square, grid square resolution. So each of those blue dots on that map just shows the occurrence of that species uh, within 10 by 10 kilometer grid squares of the British and Irish national grids. But we weren't just interested in mapping distribution. Uh, second main aim of the project was also to look at changes in distribution over time. I mean, in Britain and Ireland, we're very lucky uh, in having two previous uh, distribution uh, atlases. The first one shown on the left of this slide uh, is the Atlas of the British, British and Irish Flora published in 1962, and that was based on field work largely undertaken in the 1950s. And that was a groundbreaking piece of work. Uh, it was the first uh, dot distribution atlas of any taxonomic group undertaken anywhere in the world. And it's subsequently been used uh, for lots of other uh, taxonomic groups uh, and lots of other countries. The second main atlas was published in 2002, uh, the new atlas of the British and Irish flora, largely based on field work undertaken in the 1990s. And then obviously we have Plant Atlas 2020 based on field work undertaken between 2000 and 2019. So we took all the distribution data for all the species uh, for those three periods um, and looked at trends over time and basically was able to look at the change in the relative frequency uh, of all those species over time. And this is just a graph for one species shown here on the right. Uh, and this is the graph for bee orchid. So the graph just shows the change in its frequency at the 10 kilometer grid square since the 1950s. And you can see that there's been a gradual increase in its relative frequency over that time. So its trend it's actually increased um, in terms of its overall trend. And to do this, we used a modeling approach called Frescalo. Um, I won't go into the detail um, of, of that approach, but the important thing to take away is that it essentially attempts to correct for differences in recording effort across these three atlas periods, um, and also differences in recording effort across um, the country as a whole. So there's sort of spatial differences, because obviously you have more records for areas where more people live, and less records in less populated regions, uh, such as the, the highlands of Scotland. So we produced these trend graphs for all, uh, all, all the species included in the atlas. And just to summarize this information, we developed a trend bar, which is essentially just a simplified graphic shown down here on the bottom right. And that's, this just tells you the overall trend for the species. Um, it can range from a very strong decline to a strong increase. So you can see here it's indicating that bee orchid has had a moderate increase uh, in, its, in its relative frequency since the 1950s. The other very important thing to say about Plant Atlas 2020 is that we were not just interested in mapping the distribution of native species, such as purple saxifrage shown on the left-hand side of this slide. This is a plant which has probably we know from fossil evidence has been present in Britain and Ireland for thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. Um, and it naturally migrated here um, a long time ago. So we know that's a native plant, but we're also interested in the distributions and also the changes in the distributions of plants that have been introduced by humans. Um, and in botan botanical circles, we divide these into two main types. So we have the ancient introductions or archaeophytes, 
uh, such as the common poppy shown uh, in the middle of this slide. And these were plants that were introduced uh, probably by early farmers uh, during the Neolithic period onwards. And they tend to be associated with cultivated land or disturbed habitats such as rural areas. And then we distinguish those from modern introductions or neophytes. And these are species that have been introduced uh, to Britain and Ireland since the discovery of the new world around about 1500. Um, and many of these plants are garden plants or forestry trees um, that have been introduced via trade. Um, and the example I've just given here is American skunk cabbage, which as the name suggests, hails from North America. Uh, it's been widely grown in water gardens as an ornamental um, from where it's escaped into semi-natural habitats, such as here, which I've shown it growing in a wet woodland just on the outskirts of Harrogate, where it originated from Harlow Car Gardens, uh, just a few miles up, up the, uh, the catchment. OK, so just to give you some basic facts and figures about the survey, uh, it took 20 years to complete. So it started in 2000. Uh, finished in at the end of 2019. It involved 8,500 botanists of all abilities, right from beginners through to experts. And they went out in all weathers, uh, recording the locations of wild plants in the 4,000 odd 10 kilometer grid squares that make up the whole of Br Britain and Ireland. So during that 20 year period, uh, they gathered 30 million records of around about 3,500 species. Absolutely incredible um, effort. And today we're publishing the results of this survey, firstly on a website, um, plantatlas2020.org, and that covers all three and a half thousand species covered by the project. Um, it's, it's free to access, um, so you can just go online and all the information is on there is, is sort of free to, free to view and also download. And then the second main output um, is a two volume book uh, being published by Princeton, University Press with these lovely uh, front cover illustrations painted by uh, Chris Thorogood. And that's covering uh, around about just under 3,000 species. Um, so all, all the native species and about 1,000 non-native species. And so I just wanted to give you an example account from the book. So this is a, this is a typical account that's in the book, but all this information uh, is also contained on the website. So they look very similar. Uh, and I'll just go through the information. So this is the account for Bluebell, Isinthoides non scripta, probably one of our favourite favorite national uh, flowers. And so the main part of the caption is the species account here. So we have the name, this little indication here, the end shows that it's a native species. Uh, and the caption gives information on its habitats, its ecology, uh, trends, and also biogeography. Up here on the top right, we have the trend bars that I described a little bit earlier, and you can see that these are divided into Britain and Ireland. So we have trends for both Britain and Ireland, and also uh, over the long term, which is from the 1950s to the end of the recording period, so 2019, and also over the short term, from nine, which is 1987 to 2019, because that covers the, the second atlas that I described earlier. OK, so we also have obviously have the distribution map. So this is this is the 10 kilometer square distribution map for Bluebell. And the blue dots are the native range. So you can see it occurs as a native plant across the whole of Britain and Ireland. Um, and then you can also see these little red dots, um, and these are just uh, 10 kilometer grid squares where it's been introduced. So you can see down here in the Fenlands of East Anglia that it uh, it's actually absent as a native plant, but it has been introduced to quite a few squares. So that's the uh, distribution map. Down here, we also have key references where you can go and look for more information about the species. Um, and then we have two interesting little graphics at the bottom here. Uh, this one here is the phonology. It's just showing the leafing and the flowering months um, across the year. And then we will have this little graph here, which basically shows the distribution of records that we receive for Bluebell during the Plant Atlas project. So you can see there's a, a distinct peak here um, in April and May when obviously Bluebell um, is at the sort of peak of its flowering. 
And then this graphic here just shows the altitudinal distribution uh, of bluebell. Um, so the y-axis is the altitudinal range of the species going from um, zero up to 1200 meters altitude. And then the uh, x-axis is the uh, northing. So this at this end, the left-hand end, we have the south coast of Britain. And at the top end, we have Orkney and Shetland. This is the Scottish Highlands up here. So you can see very high ground here and then North Wales there. And then the dots represent um, the altitudinal range uh, within again the altitude against that that latitude so you can see that bluebell is obviously uh, most abundant in the sort of lowland uh, regions under under 400 meters and its distribution starts to peter out as further north you go and it's also worth mentioning that on the website we have a gallery of photos for most species which uh, which can also be downloaded Okay, and then the third main output that we're launching is the summary report for Britain, which I just want to talk about um, in the rest of this talk. Uh, there is a separate report um, produced, being produced for Ireland, which is being launched at separate launch events uh, in Belfast and Dublin. And both these reports are available to download for free on the plantatlas2020.org website. So I'll just talk a little bit about the main findings for Britain. And possibly the most revealing graphic uh, in that report uh, is this, this graph here, which is just a bar chart, which is just showing the overall changes in the distribution of species since the 1950s. And it's broken down into the natives, the archaeophytes, and the neophytes. And the blue bar represents the proportion of species that have decreased in range, orange those that have remained stable, and grey those that have increased. So straight away, you can see that in terms of the natives, over half of all species have declined since the 1950s, which is quite an, a very gloomy uh, result from the overall project. Um, the archaeophytes are slightly higher proportion have declined since the 1950s, so 62%. But for the neophytes, we have a completely, the completely opposite picture with near on 60% of neophytes having increased in range since the 1950s. So I'll just go on to just talk a little bit more about, about those main findings. So in terms of the native declines, we have a lot of information about why these species have declined, and it's largely down to the loss of semi-natural habitats, um, particularly uh, grasslands and heathlands. And I've just put two examples on this slide. So the harebell um, and heather, and you can see that both have had catastrophic declines uh, since the 1950s. Clearly, both ones very common species, but are now much more localised. And this is largely due to habitat destruction and in particularly the conversion um, of these semi-natural habitats to other land uses, such as agriculture and forestry. So many, many species like this have suffered similar declines uh, since the 1950s. The, the other key factor in their declines has been habitat modification. So not outright loss, but the intensification of management of those habitats. So the use of fertilizers, the drainage of wetlands and overgrazing, which have uh, also reduced their relative frequency since the 1950s. Okay, so now to just move on to the archaeophytes. Um, and as I said earlier, the majority of these archaeophytes are associated with disturbed and cultivated land. And we know that their decline has uh, largely occurred due to the intensification of arable cropping uh, since the 1950s. Species such as corn marigold, show, shown on this slide, uh, have, have undergone extremely rapid declines from the 1950s um, and now virtually absent from uh, from many regions. They do survive in uh, in little refugia on on lighter lighter soils where there's where, where in the intensity of management is lower so these species have tended to have declined largely due to the increased use of herbicides and fertilizers also due to improved seed cleaning techniques which remove the impurities from the crops uh, changes in the sowing times particularly the shift to autumn versus uh, spring sowing and also uh, the loss of small scale cultivation, particularly in the north and western of Britain, where in the past small scale cropping used to occur around crofts, um, but obviously that's 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 now declined, and obviously a lot of these species have declined with with the loss of that land use. 
But it's just worth pointing out that some species, uh, such as cornflower, and this graph on the bottom just shows the change in relative frequency of cornflower since the 1950s. So you can see that there, there was a decline, a bit like the corn marigold decline. Uh, but this species has actually increased quite markedly uh, since the 19, sort of mid 1980s and 1990s. And that's largely due to uh, the, the sowing of arable seed mixtures um, in public spaces, spaces, particularly in urban areas and along roadsides. And this uh, photograph at the bottom is just taken in my local park. And you can see cornflower growing happily with corn cockle and also corn marigold. And this was just a little wildfire plot that had been uh, sown just, just on the edge of the park. So this, so overall, the distribution of these species has increased quite markedly in, in, in recent decades in those sorts of habitats, but they remain extremely uncommon um, in arable situations. Okay, uh, another one of the most important findings of the Atlas 2020 project has been the extent to which some species have shifted their ranges due to climate change. And some of the most obvious examples are southerly distributed species, uh, more at home in sort of southern Britain or further south in Europe, and particularly the Mediterranean regions. And a good, possibly the best example is the bee orchid, shown on the left of this slide. Beautiful species, um, quite familiar to many people, particularly because it started to appear in gardens uh, and on uh, urban lawns, uh, you know, where lots of people have sort of stumbled across them. So you can see here there's been a, a an increase in its relative frequency over time. And that's really that really took off in the 1990s. Um, and so since then, we're seeing a sort of a, a dramatic increase and also its range has expanded. So Bee orchids historically were very much plants of calcareous grassland in southern Britain, um, but particularly in the last few decades, they've their range has expanded outwards uh, into into northern Britain, but also into other habitats. So away from calcareous grasslands into sort of more uh, mesotrophic, sort of ne neutral habitat locations, and we think this is largely due to the um, increasing win winter temperatures which is meaning that there's far fewer frosts, which in the past would have killed off its wintergreen rosettes. These are, these are rosettes that um, persist throughout the winter, um, but in the past they would have been killed off by frosts um, in northern Britain. But now because of the warmer winters and the fewer frosts, these, these rosettes are surviving and then the species is going on to flower and then dispersing and colonising new sites. Okay, but at the same time as we've been, um, we've been, seeing the colonization of these more southerly distributed species further north, we've also been seeing the decline of some montane species, particularly high altitude montane species, such as the alpine lady fern. And you can see from this graph that over the last couple of decades, this species is undergoing a sort of steady decline. Um, and we think, again, it's related to the increased temperatures, particularly during the winters, uh, which is reducing the amount of snow cover um, which reduces competition for a lot of these species, particularly ones that are associated with uh, snow beds, areas where the snow lies very late in the spring and summer. And also with the warming temperatures, we're getting an increase in the frequency and also intensity of, of droughts in these upland areas, which is obviously impacting these species, which require very humid uh, conditions. And then finally, I just wanted to touch on the dramatic increase in neophytes since the uh, 1950s. So as I showed on that bar graph before, 58% of neophytes have actually increased uh, in range. And this is largely due to planting of trees and shrubs um, in the wild. So for uh, ornamental reasons, but also for commercial forestry, and particularly species like Sitka spruce, just shown on the right hand side of this slide. Um, this this is now, Sitka spruce is now the most widely planted conifer um, uh, with about 50% of all conifers down to this species. Planting of this species increased massively since the 1950s and we're also seeing it starting to naturally regenerate outside of forestry plantations as shown here. Um, just a small sapling about 500 metres up on the slopes of Skidore in the English Lake District. And we've, it's not just been the planting of trees and shrubs but um, Many neophytes have escaped from gardens, um, either spreading from watercourses or along roadsides, or because 
uh, gardeners actually dump garden waste into wild locations and then those species establish themselves in the wild from there. It's fair to say that the vast majority of these neophytes are benign on the environment when they get into the wild, but a few have become very invasive. And I've just given three examples on this slide. So American skunk, skunk cabbage, which I showed earlier, here's here growing again in some wet woodland. New Zealand pygmy weed, um, an, introdu an introduction from Australasia, which is a very aggressive invader of the margins of uh, lakes, lakes and reservoirs and watercourses, uh, extremely um, aggressive species and known to outcompete native uh, species. And then again here, just just Sitka spruce, which as I mentioned, is now uh, naturally regenerating into um, blanket bogs and um, heathlands uh, close to plantations. Okay, so the Plant Atlas 2020 project was an absolutely magnificent success, um, but it was only made possible due to the dedication and, and expertise of the thousands of botanists who took part right from beginners uh, through to experts. And it's largely thanks to them that we have this amazing picture of the state of the nation's flora at the start of the 21st century, but not only that, how it's changed since the middle uh, of the 20th century. And it provides an incredibly powerful evidence base for policy uh, conservation and research. And it's, I think it's up to us all now to maximise its use for nature recovery in the decades ahead. OK, that's all I wanted to say. I just put up this slide, which just gives all the links to the outputs from the Plant Atlas 2020 project. And also there's my email there just in case you have any questions. OK, thank you.